So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Monica McCubrey and this is the Science of Amphibians. So this is the second um, installation of our fall season that we're doing. Um, so next week we will be doing prairie plants, which I'm very excited about. Um, and this week we're doing amphibians. So uh, thank you for joining us. If you've never been to a Science of before, welcome. If you've been to one in the past, thank you for keep coming back. We appreciate it. So um, I'm gonna really quick let my co-host, my awesome co-host introduce herself today. Hi, I'm Jamie Bachman. I'm in a partnership position with Nebraska Game and Parks and Northern Prairies Land Trust and I'm a wildlife educator. Happy to be here today. Awesome. Thanks, Jamie. And if you all have any questions or comments or concerns, um, you can utilize that chat function that's all the way down at the bottom. Uh, Jamie is really good about getting back to people or um, if she doesn't know the answer, she'll look it up, I'm sure, for you. Or we can answer, hopefully answer a majority of your questions, maybe at the end even as well. But there will be some times that we'll pause and um, we can have some good discussion as well. So um, we'll go ahead and get started because we have a lot to cover today. We're talking about amphibians. So um, this means a a lot of different types of animals, but overall we kind of that umbrella term as amphibian. So I will go ahead and share my screen for you. All right, big presenter mode, we're good to go. Awesome, thanks, Jamie. All right, so like I said, my name is Monica McCubrey and I am the Wildlife Education Specialist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And today we're going to be talking all about amphibians. So we have a lot to cover today. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right on in. Um, like we talked about earlier, any comments, questions, concerns, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, just make sure that they are on topic and related to what we're talking about. Um, just be kind to everybody and we won't have an issue, but we do have the right to remove you if we have any um, issues, which I'm sure we'll be fine with. I've never had an issue. So thank you all for being so great. Um, we will go ahead and get started. I just want to kind of do a little background information about what is an amphibian. I know we all have heard this word and it's very common. Um, a lot of people sometimes have a little bit of difficulty remembering what is an amphibian and those characteristics. So I kind of want to go over that just really quickly. Um, so when I mean go over it really quickly, I mean, let's start at the beginning. So um, amphibians, when they um, kind of evolved and adapted over time. So a lot of people, when we talk about groups of animals, we talk about mammals and we talk about birds and we talk about insects. A lot of people group amphibians and reptiles together or it's always an amphibian slash reptiles or amphibians and reptiles. They're always usually together, um, maybe because that umbrella word herpetology, which means study of reptiles and amphibians, that's kind of how it got started. Um, but the more uh, likelihood is that amphibians and reptiles just people think they go together and they kind of do. Um, but to be honest, you and I are more related to a frog than amphibians and reptiles are related to each other. Um, the, the reality is that they have not shared a common ancestor in 300 million years. So they are very far away from each other um, when we talk about them on that scale. Um, there's a huge diversity when we talk about amphibians. Um, some of them look like snakes. There's a wide range of colors and patterns. They live in lots of different types of habitats. Some of them have tails, some of them don't have tails, some of them burrow underground. Um, so out of those 40,000 known vertebrates, so these are animals with a backbone, only about 6,100 of them are amphibians. So it's a good chunk. Um, there's more reptiles than there are amphibians, but at the same time, that's a fairly good chunk when we're talking about um, vertebrates. They also are very important because these animals we believe are kind of that that link to when animals first started walking on land, they came out from the sea or the water or whatever you wanna call it. Um, these are kind of our first things that we started seeing long time ago and the very first adaptations that they had. Um, so when we talk about amphibians, that's a huge word. We break it down a little farther. There's three clades or kind of three groups under amphibians. So we have salamanders, um, which are also things like sirens and newts, if you've ever heard of those. Mud puppies fall under that category as well. Um, we have about 556 species in the world. Uh, frogs, there's about 5,400. And when I say frogs, this also is toads. Um, there are differences between them, but this 
information that I found really grouped those together. And then we also have something called Sicilians, which a lot of people have never heard of. Uh, we'll talk about those. There's about 173 species of those. So all together, when you add that up, there's 6,100-ish amphibians in the world. All right, so the word amphibian comes from the Greek word amphibious, which actually means a being with a double life. So um, basically part of their life is spent in the water and part of their life is spent on land. And just like everything else in the world and in biology, there are always exceptions. So there are some species that are permanently aquatic or permanently in the water. And there are others that are completely terrestrial. So that amphibious doesn't necessarily apply to every single species, but a good chunk or the majority of them are. Uh, they all are ectotherms though, which basically means that they use the environment to regulate their body temperature. They do not make their own body heat like mammals or people do. And um, again, when we talk about mammals, we usually know, okay, we think of hair or they, they give their babies milk. When we think of insects, they have six legs, they have three body parts. When we talk about birds, they have feathers. There's no single characteristic that defines amphibians. So it's sometimes very hard to understand where these animals fall. All right, so we'll kind of break this down into our three big groups that we have. Um, we talked about something called a Sicilian. It basically looks like an earthworm, but it is an amphibian. So in the world, there's about 173 species that kind of break down into three families. We don't know a lot about these animals. We know they look like earthworms. They lack limbs completely. Um, so a lot of people think if they find one, they're a snake or they're a worm. Um, turns out they're an amphibian. They have these ring-shaped folds of skin on them. You can kind of see in that picture. And then um, they have this wedge-shaped head. Um, it's very blunt tail. Um, they're found in the tropics, so Central and South America, Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and they're burrowing. So not only do we never see them, but they are burrowing underground and we know very little about them. One thing that's kind of cool, and we'll talk about this when they move, they basically have like an internal slinky inside of their body. So they will like move it and then bring the rest back, kind of like a caterpillar when they move. Um, they do lay eggs and we know that they lay eggs. Um, and then they also have some parental care. So reptiles and amphibians are not normally known for their um, parental care or their, um, their good parental abilities. Um, most of the times they like lay eggs and then they leave. Um, these eggs will actually hatch uh, four to six weeks later and the mom will sacrifice the dead skin on top of herself and the babies will eat it. So they um, have found that the animals that are raising children or raising young, um, they have more fat on their body to get rid of for their babies to eat than one that is not um, rearing young. So kind of interesting. This is what we kind of know, but there's a lot that we still don't know about these animals. All right. Salamanders. A lot of people look, think that they're lizards. They, they don't know what they are. This covers a lot of different types of animals. When we talk about salamanders, you might've heard of something called a newt or a mud puppy. There's lungless salamanders. There's mole salamanders. We have giant salamanders in the world. They live in places um, like China, um, and they're sometimes six feet long. We have something called a hellbender, which I don't know what sounds more badass than a hellbender, but um, we have those animals in the world and they're super cool. Um, they have these cylindrical bodies, very long tail. And then when you look at this animal, you know that this is the head. It has a distinct neck, which might not sound like a big deal, but it helps in identifying animals. They have really well-developed limbs as well. Um, some of them are aquatic, some are terrestrial, some are even arboreal. So again, a huge diversity. And a lot of them are gonna be brightly colored. Um, this is often saying that they taste bad. Um, you might've heard of something called a fire salamander before. Very, very cool, bright animal, very toxic if you would eat it or another animal would eat it. And then many of them go through an aquatic tadpole stage where they have these very cool feathery gills. And this is a picture actually of a barred tiger salamander before it loses those gills and kind of sucks them in and becomes a full-fledged adult tiger salamander. All right, and then we have our frogs and toads. This is the majority of our amphibians. Um, there's about 5,400 species. There's 45 different families. Um, when you look at them, 
mostly they're tailless, but again, there's always exceptions. Um, they're very robust. They have well-developed limbs and usually their hind limbs are about twice the size of their body, but not all frogs will jump and hop. Um, some of them are actually totally aquatic. And the only thing that they use their limbs for is to propel them through the water. Um, the differences between frogs and toads is very, um, easy when you look at them, you know, frogs, they're usually wet, slimy skin. Toads usually have kind of warty skin. Um, toads, when they jump, it's kind of more little hops and frogs, they jump longer distances. So there's very big differences between them. Um, when we talk about them, uh, frogs are mostly aquatic toads are mostly terrestrial. And then both of them go through metamorphosis. Usually the lungs will develop, the limbs will appear, and the tail is absorbed. But there is actually a tailed frog, um, so there are always exceptions. All right, do we have any questions in the chat? That was kind of just an overview of what are amphibians and what are we talking about when we talk about amphibians? There isn't anything in the chat right now, Monica. Sweet, hopefully I am doing a good job then. I, I have a question maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, do we have any Sicilians in um, North America? We don't. None in North America and Canada. They're like a super tropical species. Um, but again, we don't know that much about them. So maybe there's one hiding. Who knows? Who knows? Good question, Jamie. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about our adaptation. So when we talk about amphibians, they're very, very close to the animals that um, first started to walk on land and they have a lot of those characteristics that are still in place. Um, so when we talk about this, they have true tongues. So they moisten the food, they move the food around, um, they have eyelids, there's an outer layer of dead skin, basically in dead cells. Um, in the epidermis of their skin, which can be sloughed off. A lot of the times um, you don't see that very often like a snake shed, but toads and frogs um, and even our um, salamanders, they will slough off their skin. And a lot of the times frogs and toads will eat it. They'll just like basically recycle it back into their body um, because it has a lot of protein in it. Um, they also have true ears. They don't have those external pinna like people do, um, but they have ears and they also have that larynx, that voice producing um, box so that they can obviously call um, to their mates or to find a mate. They also have something called a Jacobson's organ, which uh, helps them smell. Uh, the snakes will have this as well. Um, their spinal cord is enlarged. And so when their body is kind of... Um, curved their back and their vertebrae come to a point and we call that a Euro style. So it has been basically fused together. They have moist skin and their skin plays an active role. So it is not um, something that just sits there, but they can move through oxygen. They can move um, water through it. They can move gases through it. So it's a very important part of their body. All right, so where are you gonna find these animals? They're found on every single continent except Antarctica. I feel like that's kind of the main, like that's a runaround answer. Like they're found everywhere except Antarctica. Um, they can live at sea level, they live in caves, they live in lightless streams, sometimes they're on very high altitudes on mountain peaks. They're very adaptable. Uh, there are no marine amphibians um, and there aren't really any on any isolated ocean oceanic islands. Um, they don't like that salt water. They can't um, literally live in the salt water, but they do have one. It's called a crab eating frog and it lives in what we call a brackish estuary. Um, so like if you've ever heard of the mangroves kind of down in Florida, that's kind of the area that they like to live in because they eat crabs. Um, they also have very high levels of urea in their bloodstream, which helps um, basically disintegrate that salt and deal with that salt in their body. And then there are some frogs, you know, we have frogs in Nebraska, we have something called the Cope's gray tree frog, which is one of those animals that can produce um, glycerol in their bloodstream to lower the freezing point of their body. So they basically freeze solid for the winter. And then in the springtime, they'll kind of defrost and warm themselves back up. So they can literally live anywhere. They've been so adaptable and there's so much variety in these animals that they can um, adapt and live pretty much anywhere. All right, so their diet and their feeding. To put it simply, they are carnivores. They do not chew their food. Um, they don't have true teeth like people do or mammals do. 
Um, the exception is that tadpoles uh, will use their mouths to scrape off algae and to filter protists from the water. So um, they're not quite true carnivores at that stage of their life, um, but when they get older and turn into adults, they will become carnivores. The smaller amphibians will eat things like insects and then larger ones, like a very large bullfrog could eat a bird. It could eat a mouse. There's something called a Pac-Man frog, which a lot of the times you might see them at places like um, Petco or PetSmart. They feed them mice. And that is not unusual for a frog to eat a mouse. Also for amphibians, cannibalism is super widespread, especially in the larval stages, um, especially in frogs and salamanders. So when they hatch, they become these voracious predators and they basically eat anything um, that will fit in their mouth. Um, there's not a lot of wiggle room um, as far as the, the space of their mouth, but they will try to eat anything that moves. And if they can fit it in their mouth, they'll probably try and eat it. All right, so how do they eat? So there's aquatic and there's terrestrial forms when they eat the aquatic ones, they have this suction method. They basically enlarge their oral cavity. It creates that negative pressure and they suck the food in. Um, this aquatic salamanders do this, tadpoles will do it. And a lot of what we call adult pipid frogs. Um, if you ever Google pipidae frogs, they're kind of neat to look at. Um, hellbenders and those giant salamanders, their mandibles move independently from each other. So they suck in prey on only one half of their mouth. Um, there's a bite and grasp method. Um, this one involves teeth, again, not true teeth, but if you've ever touched like the inside of a fish, you kind of feel that serrated um, spiny projections. That's kind of what it's like in frogs and uh, salamanders. And they also have a non-projectile tongue. So some frogs have this, salamanders have this, and then also our Sicilians. And then some frogs and most frogs actually um, have projectile tongues. It's kind of like that stereotypical frog shooting its mouth or shooting its tongue out to grab a fly. Um, tongues of frogs and salamanders are super neat. So the tongue is a projection system. It has rods in it and it has muscles on it. Um, frogs, their tongue attaches to the front of their lower jaw. So when they uh, stick it out or they projectile it out, the tongue goes all the way out. It has to be flipped upside down so that that sticky part attaches to that thing that they are eating. Salamanders also have the most advanced tongue projection system. Theirs sits on the anterior tip, not the floor of the mouth. And between them sticking their tongue out, grabbing their food and pulling it back in, that prey capture cycle only takes about four to six milliseconds. So faster than you can blink. All right, and then uh, in frog tongues, there's two different types of muscles. There's called the extender and the retractor. So the extender will go out at about four meters a second, super fast. And then the retractor muscle yanks it back like a bungee cord. Um, a frog's tongue is 10 times softer than a human tongue. We kind of think that that's one of the softest muscles that we have in our body, and it's not wrong. Um, 10 times softer for a frog. And then it's also kind of comparable to the softness of our brain tissue. So that's one of the softest muscles that we have in our body. Very, very comparable to that. So why does it need to be so soft? Well, it makes it flexible. Prey aren't usually sitting there just waiting for them to eat them. They're moving around, they're crawling. So they have to be flexible to grab that prey. Um, and then once they suck their food back in, um, they have to dislodge it. So it's sticky. So the frog will actually suck its eyeballs back into the head and that pressure from the eyeballs slides the prey off the tongue and then they're swallowed whole. How cool is that? How cool is that? <laughs> Um, and they're also very fast. We talk about this. They can shoot their tongue out, capture an insect, pull it back into its mouth in 0.07 seconds, which is five times faster than the human eye can blink. Um, the prey and the force that that prey exhibits, it's about 12 Gs or 12 times the force of gravity. So when an astronaut goes up into space during a rocket launch, they experience about three Gs of power. So a frog capturing that insect with its tongue four times like faster and, and thicker and bigger than that rocket launch. Um, but if you think about it, a frog's tongue is not sticky all the time. Otherwise it would stick to its mouth and it couldn't get out. Um, so the tongue produces mucus right before the tongue impacts the insect. So if you think about it, 
to stick it out, capture the insect, pull it back. Um, right before that, you create some mucus, you grab it and you pull it back 0 0.07 seconds. Um, it's also five times stickier than honey and it can lift about 1.4 times their weight. So that would be like humans lifting a refrigerator with their tongue. Like, so cool, so cool. All right, so how do amphibians move? Um, there's lots of different ways that they do this. Salamanders and Sicilians, um, they swim like fish and they have these side to side movements. Uh, frogs, a lot of the times they are swimming and jumping. So we talked earlier about their vertebral column. Um, basically, um, it's fused into a backbone. Um, it's called the urostyle. And the bones of the hind legs have become elongated so that they can jump. Uh, frogs also have inflexible bodies and they swim by means of simultaneous thrusts of the legs. So when they're swimming, it's, if you would swim, you use your flippers and your feet and your legs to push you forward. It's very similar to that. And then there's terrestrial salamanders. So they move by means of lateral, what we call lateral undulation. Um, it's kind of like a dinosaur. It looks very primitive. And basically, um, if your left foot goes up, your back foot is the opposite. If your right foot goes up, your back foot's the opposite. So even some species will use their tail as almost a fifth leg to brace themselves and to go faster. And then Sicilians, they're legless. So they use this alternating slinky method. Um, their vertebral column bends, it comes to points of contact with the soil, and then it will just keep moving through the ground. So they are burrowing animals. So there's really no need for legs to get in the way um, or tails to be really honest. So um, they need to have as fewer body parts as possible when they're moving through that soil. All right. Any questions? There are a couple questions, but they might be better for at the end. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to field it that way for you, Monica. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Jamie. All right. So we'll go ahead and get into our reproduction stage. Um, did anyone see the movie? It was like Grease 2 when they like sing the reproduction song. I don't know. When I was typing this out, that's what I, what I thought about. Thanks, Jamie. I'm, I'm not alone. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. So reproduction. So the greatest diversity reproduction method of any vertebrate. So there's so many different ways that they do this. The most primitive families are those giant and those Asiatic salamanders. It is external fertilization. So the sperm is shed into the water near the eggs. Um, most salamanders, though, what they will do is they have something called a spermatophore. So the male will leave these little sperm packets. The females will come pick them up and then insert them into her cloaca um, during courtship. Mole salamanders, it's kind of interesting because they are asexual reproduction. So the sperm will basically just trigger that asexual reproduction. It has no contribution to genetics at all. And then frogs, mostly they internalize um, or fertilize internally. Um, this is called amplexus. So if you've ever seen a frog grab onto a female through the armpits, that's what it's called. It's amplexus. And then most Sicilians um, will fertilize internally as well. But again, just like the frogs, there's always an exception. Most of them internalize, uh, fertilize internally, but not every single one of them. Um, also, most amphibian species are what we call oviparous. So that just means they lay eggs outside of the body. Others are viviparous, which means that the mother retains those embryos inside the body and they will come out alive. Uh, numbers also vary range hugely. Um, there's some amphibians that lay a single egg and there's some like the bullfrog that can lay up to 20,000 or 25,000 eggs at once. Um, newts usually only lay up to about 400. Salamanders are a few dozen. Frogs are usually a little bit more. They can be laid in strands, clusters, um, sometimes singly. But the one thing that they all have in common is this gelatinous like envelope, basically, that covers them um, so that they don't dry out. And then they also vary their sites. So running water, mud basins, sometimes cavities under logs and stones. Um, there's a tree or there's a frog in the, I think the Amazon that will lay its eggs um, in a leaf overhanging the water. And then when they hatch, the eggs and the uh, tadpoles will fall into the water. Um, so it's like a guarantee they're going to make it to that water. 
All right, so some subtle signals about how they are ready to reproduce. They have chemical, acoustic, visual, or tactile signals. So Sicilians, they mostly use chemical, um, so smells, and then tactile touches. So these Sicilians have something called a protrusible tentacle. Um, they're basically raised with the hydrostatic pressure. We're not really sure what it does, but we think that it helps to locate prey underground. And also if they come together, a male and a female, it helps find each other. Salam Salamanders may basically use chemical signals, so different odors, um, very similar to mammals. They can tell um, what species it is, they can tell the sex of the animal, and they can also increase the receptivity of that animal as well. Frogs, we know a lot of times they use acoustic signals because we hear them a lot. Um, there are tons of different species of frogs that have a specific call, species call to attract. Other times they have a call to establish a territory, or sometimes they even have a what's called a release call. If you don't know what a release call is, sometimes Frogs are not the smartest. Um, so male frogs will literally try to um, get on the backs of other male frogs. And their release call is like, hey dude, I'm a guy. I'm not, I'm not right here to mate. I'm trying to find a girl. So the other male frog will then be like, oh, sorry, dude. And then like go away. So it's a release call saying, hey, I'm, I'm not here to mate. I'm trying to find a girl. I'm not a girl. Um, so it's, and then there's another one, um, a Brazilian frog. It's called the torrent frog. They have foot flagging signals. So it's almost like a wave. So they're like, hey, how's it going? Or they'll move their feet up and down um, as a visual signal to be like, this is my territory, or I'm ready to mate, or nope, I'm not what you want. So it's really interesting to see those signals in all those different species. All right, and then I kind of want to finish on um, what do we have in Nebraska as far as amphibians? Any questions? Or kind of wait till the end still? So. Wait till the end? Okay, sweet. Um, so Nebraska amphibians, I didn't have all of them on here because um, it would take too long, but I tried to do ones that are very common throughout the state that you are more likely to see. Um, so in Nebraska, we have 14 species of salamanders, 11 frogs and toads, and three species of salamanders. We do not have Sicilians, and there are no newts native to Nebraska. Um, so all amphibian species will come to the water um, habitats to breed. It's either going to be in the winter, the spring, or the summer. Uh, they all produce those gelatinous eggs. Depends on if a, a toad or a frog, whether that they will lay them in a cluster, a long string, or even some of our salamanders will lay them individually. Uh, when the salamanders hatch, they have those feathery gills that we talked about. Um, they will be absorbed then, and then they will also have internal lungs. Uh, most animals are all amphibians can be found anywhere in the state. Um, we have amphibians out in western Nebraska with that drier climate in the short grass prairie, but we also have a lot of amphibians on this side of the state as well. Um, being amphibians and living in those aquatic environments, they are highly susceptible to things like pollution and toxins in the waterways, um, especially being a state that has a lot of irrigation and does a lot of um, corn and soybeans and things like that, there's a lot of pesticides and herbicides and insecticides. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. All right, so here's like the most common toad that you're gonna see in Nebraska. They're called a Woodhouse's toad. Um, toads are gonna to be a little bit more of that terrestrial type of animal. They like parks, golf courses, gardens. Um, they really like areas that are sandy soil. So you can find them here in the Lincoln area, but a lot of the times once you hit about Kearney West, they're gonna be more common because they like those sandy soils. They also have a very cool call. If you've ever heard a calf or a sheep bleat, this is what they sound like. It's very nasally and it's like a wah sound. Um, so when you hear that, you know, it's a woodhouse's toad. Um, these guys lay their eggs in very long strings like other toads in Nebraska. And to identify this animal, you're going to see, especially on this picture, there's a single black spot on the chest that helps with identification. And then they also have a very long white stripe that goes all the way through their eyes and all the way down to basically where their tail would be. So kind of easy to identify them with that black spot and the white stripe. All right, one of our smaller frogs, these guys rarely get over an inch long. They're very common in temporary and permanent bodies of water. 
pretty much anywhere where there's water, you could find them. Um, it's interesting because in the fall, in places like Jefferson, Gage, and Thayer counties, there's a lot of limestone. They can actually be quite a distance from water, but they like those limestone areas, which is unique because frogs, they dry out very quickly and they need water. Um, they also have this really weird uh, habitat or this weird habit that when you see them, they get scared, they jump in the water, they swim away and they come right back to shore. It's not necessarily the most like survival instinct method because you think a predator would just grab them, but it's just something that they kind of do. They're also fairly cold intolerant, uh, tolerant, sorry. They like the cold. Um, they're usually out earlier. They're, they're out later uh, compared to other amphibians. And then they're a member of the tree frog family, but unlike the tree frog, they are mostly ground dwellers. And then these guys, when they call, it sounds like two marbles clicking together. It makes like a rick, 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 rick sound. All right, boreal frogs, these are the ones that you hear very early in the spring. They usually don't exceed about 1.3 inches. They have stripes that extend all the way down their body um, and especially through the eyes. So that's how you can tell whether it is a coarse frog versus a cricket frog. Um, these guys, if you ever hear a lot of them calling at once, they have a very loud call for as little as they are. And sometimes they're even like deafening if you hear so many of them at once, especially in the springtime. Uh, these guys, they call very early and oftentimes they lay eggs and those eggs even hatch before a lot of other frogs in the spring even start calling. So they have a very short, um, life cycle and it gets going quickly and they're found pretty much anywhere in Nebraska. All right, um, bullfrogs, this is our largest frog. It could get anywhere from five to seven inches. They also vary in color. Um, this one's green, but they can be brown. They could have spots on them. There was a photo that someone sent in on um, Game and Parks website on Facebook, actually. It was almost like blue. It was a like a Crayola blue color. So they can vary in color. They can vary in um, pattern as well. Uh, they're also pretty cold uh, tolerant. You can see them on warm days in even December and February. They've been seen on the banks calling um, in December and February. So think about that. Uh, these guys also produce large amounts of eggs, up to 20,000 sometimes in a single cluster. The unique thing about these is that the tadpoles will overwinter at least once um, for the year. Sometimes if conditions are not good or even really Northern species, the uh, tadpoles will sometimes stay tadpoles for up to two to three years and then metamorphosis into an adult. So it's just a very good um, adaptation to know that the, the environmental conditions have to be good for that animal to come out as an adult. And if they're going to survive, they need good conditions. And if it's not good, then why should I become an adult? Um, these guys, the only thing that they limit is when they eat is just by the size of their mouth. So they have been caught eating lots of native frog species, insects. They can eat things like mice and birds, um, other frogs. And then in Nebraska, these frogs are actually managed as a game species. So there is a season on them. There is a bag number and a permit number for them. Um, so it's a little bit different than a lot of our other amphibian species. All right. And then tat or sorry, and then salamanders. So we have three different types of salamanders. We have the barred tiger salamander. We have the Eastern tiger salamander, and then we have something called a small mouth salamander. Um, so the barred tiger, very common. There's two variants in color and pattern, depending on where you find them in Nebraska, the Southern species, um, or the Southern, I guess, um, pattern that you're going to find, they're going to have spots. And then once you get a little bit farther north, they're going to kind of turn more into bands. Um, they're the same species. They're just a little bit different in their variation. One thing about these is that we're not sure about where we're finding these or if they're native to Nebraska, because a lot of people, um, you can purchase them not as adults, but as that larva tadpole form in bait shops. Um, so you find a lot of atypical salamanders in Nebraska, especially in bodies of water, because people use them as bait species and sometimes they escape. Um, they can live to be 20 years old, though, which is very uh, unusual for an amphibian, They're usually six to eight inches long. They like permanent or semi permanent bodies of water, but they don't like fish in their ponds, like at least big fish. Um, 
if you think about it, those are the animals that are going to eat them. Um, they live out in Western Nebraska and they inhabit uh, prairie dog burrows. They're very reliant on those prairie dog burrows because when it's hot, that's where they will go. Um, during the hibernation time, that's where they go. Um, and they do that during the day as well because they're mostly a nocturnal species. And then these guys, very, very common to have them become cannibals, especially in their larva stage. They're hungry and they're voracious and they will eat anything, even each other. All right, so just a few things about what's happening with our amphibian species, and then we will open it up to questions. And then that's our, that's our show today. All right, so threats to amphibians. Um, if you have been paying attention, they are one of the most endangered groups of animals. So they're, they're disappearing at a very alarming rate. We think with about the last 30 years or so, about um, 100 species have gone extinct. Um, but there's also a lot of species that we're still discovering. Uh, they're small, they inhabit very niche areas and habitats. So it's sometimes hard to know, is this a separate species? Is this a subspecies? Or sometimes it's a brand new species. But currently about one third of all of our amphibians are threatened with extinction. So number one thing is because of habitat loss. But there's also a lot of other things. There's environmental pressures. There's a lot of pesticides and pollutants, and they're very susceptible being aquatic animals. Um, introduction of predators to areas, invasive species, disease. But again, that most important thing is because there's not a lot of suitable habitat for them. Um, they are very essential if people think, what's it matter if we lose a couple of frog species? They're this huge link between the tidy things that they eat their prey, and then the larger vertebrates that eat them. So they're this huge trophic link. If they disappear, what's the animal going to do that eats them? And, and then the animals that they eat, they're going to go out of control. Uh, tadpoles are also the most major consumers of the algae in the water and the protists. So they kind of clean up our ponds and our lakes. And then in Nebraska, uh, one thing that we're seeing is there's a lot of herbicides that have caused uh, some species of frogs to become hermaphroditic. So when they come in contact with these herbicides and these pesticides, the basically what happened is it turns the male female and the frogs during that larval development, or what will happen is they are fine and they come out with five legs or two heads. So there's a lot of mutations that happen. Um, and we're really trying to figure out what can we do to save that and, and why it's happening so quickly. There's also something in Nebraska. It's been found in Nebraska. It's been found in a lot of tropical areas in the world. It's called chytrid fungus. You might have heard of it. Um, it's a very, very short term for the long B word that I'm not going to pronounce because it's not going to go well. Um, but there's a lot of mass amphibian declines because of this disease. So what happens is that it infects the keratin or the skin layers of the animal. And you can see in this photo how um, the legs and the arms have become really red. So what happens is it thickens their skin and it sloughs off. But what happens is they can't absorb and they can't get rid of stuff in their body. So we talked earlier about how they, um, it's an active transport. So they can uh, suck in some oxygen. They can take out those gases. Well, when your skin thickens, that doesn't happen. So it makes it difficult for the amphibian to breathe. It can't transport those nutrients from the water to their skin. Um, a lot of the times when you see an amphibian that is, um, infected with this, they're very lethargic and they have that discolored skin. So that orangish kind of pinky red skin is like a direct giveaway. Um, we found it in Nebraska before, and it's not just frogs, salamanders and toads can also um, have this happen to them. Um, one thing that is very scary is that once a water body or a source is infected, it could possibly stay in the water forever. Um, we know that this was a thing long time ago. Um, we think with climate change, heating up the waters, it triggers this disease to become more prevalent. Um, and so um, it's kind of awakened, I guess. But I mean, in the one end, bullfrogs are immune. Um, we don't know why. They just are one of those species that they don't have an issue with this. They can live in infected waters and, and come out just fine. So if anything, we will have bullfrogs in the world. Yeah. All right. So that was our... Uh, 
our webinar today. We had a ton of information and I really love frogs and toads and, and reptiles and amphibians. So this was fun for me to do. Um, if you really like this and want to join us next week, we have one on prairie plants. Uh, so talking about some different adaptations that prairie plants have and what prairie plants are in Nebraska. Uh, we also have one coming up on spiders, eggs, and our last one for the season for the year is going to be on migration. So don't miss any of those. They each have their own individual registration link. Um, and if you visit our Facebook page or our outdoor calendar for Nebraska Game of Parks, you can find the registration links for those. If you really like this today and you're like, gosh, I just want to learn more, you can check out. We have an education YouTube channel. Um, we have a playlist called Science Of. So every single one that we've done in the past um, will be on there for you to view. There's ones on things like invasive species. There's lichen. There's fungus. There's lots of different types and topics. We also have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram page. And we also have just our regular uh, website, just outdoornebraska.gov slash wildlife education. You can find uh, everything from scavenger hunts and lesson plans to information on outdoor classrooms and other things that we do here in our education division. And then with that, are there any questions? I will go ahead and stop sharing. So, so I can one, see all one, of the, one of the questions was about um, the, th the th dangers, and I knew you were going to cover that because you're, oh, okay. you're such a good nerd that way. <laughs> and the other one was, um, or in your first maybe five or six slides, there was a, 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 a red salamander in the photo. And um, uh, someone was asking uh, where it was located. So the red one was not in Nebraska. It is not a Nebraska species. Um, I don't remember what type of salamander it was. It's really hard to find good quality photos of Nebraska species. Um, so I tried to get some from across the world. Um, I don't remember what kind it was, but it was not a native salamander to Nebraska. All right, good. I hope, I hope the lack of questions means that I just covered everything and that I was very thorough. So hopefully that's it. I hope all of you learned about some cool things. Um, I know it's not amphibian related, but October is reptile month in Nebraska. And starting actually Monday, we have our annual reptile art contest coming up. Um, you can find more information on our Facebook page or on our Game of Parks page as well. Um, so be sure to have any of your K through 12 kid kiddos um, send in some stuff. They get some free swag. It's pretty nice swag. So make sure you send in some stuff and we can talk about reptiles then. Great. Thank you, Sarah. I'm glad you learned a lot. Thank you everyone for joining us. And we did record this. So if you missed some of it, or if you want to send it to somebody, it will give us probably 24 hours and it will be up on our education YouTube channel for Game of Parks. So, and thank you, Jamie, for moderating. Appreciate it. Thanks, Monica. It was super great. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Bye. See you next time.